The following is an encore presentation of a pre recorded program. To join one of our many live presentations, please visit cje.net slash events, call 773-508-1000, or follow us on your favorite social media platform. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our program. This is Insights on Aging. Our program today will be on making good decisions about taking medication. My name is Roseanne Corcoran, and I'm the manager of CJE Senior Life Counseling Services. If there are any professionals in attendance today, I wanna to let you know right from the start that we will not be offering any professional CEUs for this program. These monthly community education programs are part of an effort by CJE and our counseling services program to highlight important aging and mental health issues. Our goal is to provide essential information to the individuals and families that we serve. Please be aware that all of these insights and aging programs are recorded and are available on our website. If you provided an email when you registered for the program, you'll be sent a follow-up email later today with the link um, to our page where this recording will appear. As well, I'm going to include other documents that the speaker will be using today. And we'll also have a link in there for a program evaluation. It does take a, a couple weeks to prepare the recording, but it will appear at that link on our webpage. The other thing for you to be aware of is that since this program is being recorded to be shared, we have higher privacy features in place. So your participation today is anonymous. You won't be able to see other participants. And when you use the Q&A feature, your name will not be shared. We do encourage you to participate and use that Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of your screen. It's a button that says Q&A. That's where you can ask questions of the speaker. Uh, we are not using the chat feature today. That's disabled, but do put your questions in the Q&A. Also be aware that we've enabled auto transcribing and closed captioning. In order to use these features, you do need to turn this on manually on your device. I've turned it on for the program, now you have to turn it on. So again, at the bottom of your screen, you should have the option of CC live transcript. If you click on that, you can either su select subtitles or you can select a full transcript view. And then you can adjust the font size to fit your personal needs. As the host, I'll be monitoring the Q&A and I'll alert the speaker if there are issues that come up. And if it's something we need to interrupt her for, I'll certainly do that. Otherwise, the speaker will talk for the first 45 minutes and then she'll take questions that are in the Q&A at the end of the program. Before we start, one more thing. I wanna mention that CJE Senior Life Counseling Services does offer a full range of older adult behavioral health services. These include individual, group and family psychotherapy, support groups, and family and caregiver support. All of these services are presently available through telehealth, either online with video or on the telephone. If someone cannot participate in telehealth, we can offer face-to-face -face sessions in our offices on a case-by-case -case basis. We are still following COVID protocol in our offices and in all of our visits to reduce unnecessary exposure for clients and staff. Now, let me introduce today's speaker. CJE's favorite consultant on addiction issues and someone we've worked very closely with for many years. This is Nina Henry who's the Addiction Specialist and Mental Health Educator at JCFS Chicago. Nina, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Um, I'm, uh, I just want to briefly qualify myself and say a few things before I get rolling with the, the prepared material. Um, just so you know that in addition to this kind of program, I also do professional training and I've done some professional work inside of CJE Senior Life for JCFS and many other programs and, and things throughout the greater Chicago area. But the thing I want all of you to know about, and I'll make sure that you have my information at some juncture 
Uh, certainly you'll get it when Roseanne sends things out after the program. But one of the things I do is called information and referral. So if you have a friend, colleague, family member about whom you're concerned with regard to mental health or substance use, certainly you can call your friends at CJE with regard to the mental health piece, but substance use is my area, as Roseanne said, so please feel free. I've been doing addictions work for over 30 years, and so I'm happy to help you with those kinds of issues. Now, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and find my PowerPoint in there somewhere so I can show it to you. And I'm going to make sure I optimize sound and video just in case yeah, just to make sure that you can really see everything nicely. I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the slideshow and there it is. And Roseanne's gonna let me know if you can't see it, but I think you can. So uh, I'm gonna go, I, I have to go all the way back to the beginning. Somehow I ended up at the end. So I'm gonna go back to the beginning. There we are, sorry about that. Um, so again, uh, we're going to learn about making good decisions about taking medication. And I'm going to have a little disclaimer right away. Through many of the slides, I'm going to be mentioning not only generic names of substances and medications, I'm also going to be mentioning brand names. And that's really not because I'm representing any phar pharmaceutical companies or I'm trying to sell you on any particular brand, but because those are the names that you maybe are familiar with. I know the generic names and you maybe even are familiar with them as well but most folks know the brand name. So I just, I wanted to get that disclaimer out of the way. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about what our goals for today are. So our goals for today is to learn, as you may already know some stuff, right? I'm, I'm gonna assume some of you are very familiar with what commonly used medications are, but I am gonna hopefully expand your horizons on that a little bit. I'm also going to talk about over-the-counter, I'm going to, you can see they're in quotation marks, natural medications, um, and you'll see what that is as we get into things, but you may be familiar with things like melatonin and valerian root, and we're going to spend some time talking about some, a very interesting substance called coenzyme Q10, or CoQ10, a lot of people have begun to learn about that, and we'll talk about that today. Um, of course, I'm going to help you, my, my biggest goal is to make sure everyone is taking their medications and over-the-counter medications in the safest way possible. Finally, in the last few slides, we're gonna also talk about what you're doing to monitor whether or not your medications are expiring and what you're doing when they expire. And are you making sure that other people in your household or people visiting your household aren't making off with some of your very important medications? I hope that that's not the case, but You'll see later on, I'm gonna give you some data that'll tell you that that in fact happens in a lot of households. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, I'm gonna ask questions, but I'm gonna answer my own questions because as Roseanne said, the Q&A is your vehicle to ask me questions and I'll have time at the end of the program to tell you things about, uh, to answer your questions and tell you more about these questions that I'm asking. So why, when should you use medications? Well, I'm going to say that medication should always be used in consultation with your physician, right? You also, you, and also if you have a psychiatrist, should be also used only in consultation with your psychiatrist, who also is a medical doctor. And actually, I'm going to mention a third individual that you should also be using in consultation with, and that's your pharmacist. And frankly, it's easier to get in touch with your pharmacist in many cases than it is with a doctor, right? You can just walk into your local drugstore and ask your pharmacist about the medication you're taking. That's one of the things they study most of all when they're learning to be pharmacists. So it's really good to know that not only your primary care physician, your medical specialist, or your psychiatrist, but also your pharmacist. And any decisions to decrease, increase, stop, or change your medication should always be done in consultation. So, and also, when should you use these medications? When diet, exercise, physical, and mental health therapy fails to do the job, right? So you should always, really, I think of medications as that last stop. So I'll give you a, an example for my own life, and then I'm going to move on with the other slides. Not so long ago, just this past December, I began to notice neuropathy or numbness in the tips of my fingers. And I thought to myself, well, let me, you know, I could try some 
Advil. Uh, that's my particular brand that I like. You may like something else for pain management. We'll talk more about that later. So I took a little Advil and it did make things better, but as most of you know, and I'll talk more about this too, Advil can cause tummy disturbance. And I didn't really want to do that. Um, so I decided that I was going to try things like, you know, I actually went and got some physical therapy. I've been doing some things so that I don't have to take medication. So exercise, and I'm in consultation with a physical therapist, which I got referred to by my medical doctor, right? I didn't just start that on my own, but this, you know, so those kinds of things you might want to engage in before you rush to taking that painkiller or that NSAID. So let's talk for a moment about what medications we actually are using. Um, this data, if you're curious, um, comes from the National Institutes of Health, which is a big, you know, it's a, a large national organization and they do lots of, re so this, this data probably comes from 2019 because they do these huge, you know, nationwide studies. It takes a long time for them to collate the data. So even though it was gathered in 2019, it became available toward the end of 2020. So this is relatively recent information. I personally was surprised to learn that 15% of the United States population on average is taking antidepressants. I would suspect due to the pandemic that it might be even higher than that now. Um, what we're learning, those of us who work in the mental health and substance use fields is that all of the problems that were maybe bad enough before the pandemic have gotten worse. So it's, it was 15% in 2019. I suspect it might be 20 to 25% now. That's a lot, that's a quarter of the population, but there are a lot, of, lot more people that are taking antidepressants. You'll see another big one there are statins to lower cholesterol, um, then ACE inhibitors to lower blood pressure. So these are the things that we probably use the most, especially those of us who are older adults, and I just want to alert you to the, the picture that's on this slide it is one of the very best ways to safeguard your use of medications to make, your, make sure you're taking what you need when you need it is to use those packages, right? So that one is probably like a, a weekly packaging or a monthly packaging of your medications. And that way, you know, at certain times of day, you take this medication at other times of the day, you take this other medication. So I highly, if you're not already using those, you should get together with your doctor or maybe your adult children and figure out how you can package your medications for safely taking them. I promised I'd also talk about quote unquote natural medications, over the counter medications. I was very surprised, although I now on second thought, maybe I shouldn't have been so surprised that fish oil, which contains omega-3 is close to 8%. Again, this is National Institutes of Health, so a very big, very well-vetted organization is doing this um, research again from 2019. Um, you know, it's really kind of surprising to me just how many people are using fish oil omega-3. I will tell you right away that it's very well-researched and we know that omega-3 uh, can be very good for your heart health. Um, the yeah. next one, yes, ma'am. Can I interrupt you? We are Absolutely. having an issue with your PowerPoint. There's there's a gray bar. Ah, uh, that probably is, you know, that hopefully will go away if I don't touch the screen too much. I can't make it go away, unfortunately. I'm okay. gonna try one thing and see if it helps. Does that help? That helped, that made the difference. Yay, well, I'm glad I tried that. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you for Thank letting you. me know that because okay. I want people to be able to see the, the images yes, on this. I appreciate great. it. Thank you. I'm going to make one other comment on this screen. Well, actually, maybe a couple more. Um, glucosamine or chondroitin. I don't have any more information about this later in the presentation. So I wanted to make sure that I, uh, you know, it says close to 3% of the United States po uh, population is taking glucosamine and or chondroitin. And generally, it's taken for arthritic problems. I am going to let you know, and this is according to the Mayo Clinic, again, a really well-respected organization, um, that aggregate re research, so that means aggregated research from lots of sources, not just the Mayo Clinic, 
finds that glucosamine and or chondroitin are not really doing the things that we take them for. So um, you may want to re it doesn't hurt you. There's no adverse effects from, from those substances, but it's not necessarily helping you. Sometimes there's a placebo effect. We have faith that something's going to work. So we go ahead and take it anyway, because it does seem to help. But just in terms of biomedically, we know from research that it actually isn't having the effect that it's often taken for. Uh, and we will go return, as I promised, to CoQ10, the coenzyme Q10, in a little while. So I wanted to spend a little time about what it means. You know, most of the people I'm assuming on this call are older adults. You're 55 years of age or older. Um, so one of the things that's really important to recognize is that as we age, our bodies change, and that causes the way we take medications to change as well. It's not so much how we take them, but the effect, I mean, what happens in our body that changes the way it affects us. So, you know, your body is going to change, your metabolism is going to slow down. I'll talk more about the ways in which your body changes in a minute. Um, you are more likely to be taking more medications, right? So one medication might actually have an impact on another medication you're taking. So we have to be mindful of that. Again, take it taken in consultation with your medical professionals because they're gonna know if one medication with another is not safe or is going to give you bad side effects. Um, and I'll actually illustrate some of those later on in the program. Um, the more medications we take, bottom line is the greater chance for problems. Um, you're more likely to see more than one doctor if they're not communicating with one another. If you're not signing releases to allow your doctors to communicate, they may not know without you telling them that you're taking a medication that is you know, counterproductive for you with another medication that they're prescribing. Um, so, and then there might be something as simple as because you have arthritis, uh, I know I struggle with this, I have a hard time unscrewing caps on bottles. So it might just be hard for you to take the medication because you can't get the cap off. And so you might decide, oh, I'm not gonna take that today because it's just too hard to open the bottle, right? So those are the kinds of things that happen as we get older. And I have to tell you, you have to find some other solutions about that, that bottle because you need to take that medication if the doctor's prescribed it. So some of the changes, I promise to tell you what happened. So, First and foremost, as we get older, we uh, the body water, the, just the water that's contained in the cells of our body decreases. And so what that causes is for the medications to be more concentrated in your body and more potent. Say, it's safe to say that your doctors are aware of this, so they may be prescribing to you as you get older, a smaller amount of a medication that you took at a higher dose earlier on in your life, because now it's gonna be more concentrated in your body and therefore more potent. Pretty much everything we put in our body affects the liver. Why is that? Because the liver is sort of the filter in our body. It filters out the impurities of the, you know, what we drink, what we eat, what we take into our bodies. But as we get older, because that stresses the liver, right? The more things you put in the body, the more stress you put on your liver. Medications happen to really stress, even if it's a good medication, it does stress the liver. And so as you get older, that function decreases. So some medications accumulate in the body because they're metabolized more slowly because of that stress that's on the liver. Also, a, lot, a similar thing happens with the kidneys. Again, state, you know, the kidneys are not functioning at the same rate that they did when you were younger. So medications stay in your body longer and increases their effects and they're more prolonged. And one of the things that's important to know about that with regard to liver and kidney function, if you, for instance, take a sedative, which as it is, has what's called a longer half-life, it already stays in your body a long time because of that longer half-life, it's going to stay in your body even longer as you age. And so that affects whether or not you can take a drink at a, at a cocktail party, because drinking and taking a sedative at the same time can be not so good for you. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So definitely as you age, your body is changing. Another thing that happens is 
sorry to say this, especially this is especially true even more in women than in men, your, your body fat increases. And so again, that does mean that things are in your body longer. And for those of you who take medical marijuana prescribed by your doctor, or those of you who are buying it recreationally, I don't know if there's a lot of you on this call that do that, cannabis, particularly THC, which is one of the active ingredients in ca cannabis, marijuana, um, that is what's called a lipid soluble substance, which means it kind of lives in your fat cells. Whereas some medications go through your gast gastrointestinal tract and, and, and come out through, uh, you know, when you're excreting things, when you go to the bathroom. Uh, unfortunately, cannabis stays in your system much longer because it kind of lives in your fat cells before it gets in excreted and can be in your body anywhere from 30 to 90 days. So, um, so just so you know, um, it's gonna hang out in your body a whole lot longer than maybe other substances do. So again, ordinarily, if I, if I had the ability to interact with you in, in the same room, which we can't do thanks to COVID, um, I would actually ask you to answer these questions for me, but I'm gonna go ahead and do the answering. So what are the mistakes we make with medication? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk for just a moment from the perspective of being an addictions professional and addiction specialist. I can't think of a single client I've had in over 30 years of working in this field where someone intentionally used medications to get high initially, right? They may have started out most of the time when people are taking medications like opiates for pain management or sedatives to help them sleep. They're not using that medication initially with any kind of intent to get sedated or high in a fun way, right? Or in a recreational way. Most folks start off because the doctor is recommending it to help you sleep in the case of sedatives or to help with pain management in the case of say arthritis or just after some sort of procedure. And pretty much no one sets out to be addicted to a substance, right? So all of the mistakes that we call it substance misuse because people don't intend to misuse, but they do because we're all human beings and human beings make mistakes, period, end of sentence. So we might take more than is prescribed, why? So, you know, I know I took hydrocodone once because I had a bad cough. And I have to be honest with you, I, before I actually consulted with my physician, I took a little more than was prescribed because I liked the way it felt. But then I kind of worried, I felt maybe I shouldn't be doing this. So I called the doctor and he said, Miss, Ms. Henry, please do not take more than is prescribed. But perfectly innocently, I took it because it felt better. I was miserable with this cough and taking the hydrocodone, the Vicodin, made me feel better. Sometimes we take less because we don't like the side effects or we, you know, we don't like taking medications in general. And I know my husband hates to take medications. Somehow he thinks it's, I don't know, less manly or something. I don't know why. He just doesn't like to take medications. And I think probably a lot of you share that feeling. Um, so we take less than we're supposed to, or we take it more often or less often than we should, or we forget. Uh, I definitely have forgotten my Lipitor. No question about it. You know, I'm busy. I'm running to get out of the house early and I forget to take my Medicaid. Uh, that's not unusual. That's why, you know, you saw those medication packets at the beginning of the, the session today. I highly recommend those because that, that helps you not to forget to take your medications. Sometimes we really don't like the side effects. So we maybe stop before we're supposed to. Or we may give other people our medicine. That's, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna be really forceful on this one. That's a big no-no. You may ask yourself, what you'll ask me later on, why not? Why shouldn't I, you know, if something's working really great for me, and, and that's not just prescribed medication, that's also over-the-counter medication, because again, you're taking all of this in consultation with a doctor. The reason you shouldn't give something like, if you're a five foot nothing, 110 pound female, you should not be giving a six foot two, 250 pound male your medication. Why? Because your size, weight, and gender does 
have some impact on what the doctor is prescribing to you, what the dosage is, what kind of medication, what it's for. You should never, never be sharing your medication with another people, no matter how great it makes you feel, no matter how wonderful it is. You know, there's a lot of, you, look, there is medicine that are absolutely medical miracles. You feel like, oh my gosh. I mean, actually my doctor who prescribed Lipitor thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bananas. He thought every should, everybody should be on a statin because it does really significantly imp improve your, your vascular health. And you know, so he was a very big proponent of that, but that doesn't mean you should be giving it to other people. Um, and of course, again, don't take anything if it's offered to you either, unless you, really not even unless you talk to the doctor, under no circumstances should you be giving other people medicine or taking it from other people. And why, you know, why, why all of these things are important? Well, if you don't take medications as prescribed, a lot of bad things can happen, right? You may not get well, first of all. If you don't take the medication your doctor is prescribed, you know, chances are you're not going to feel better. Um, you might actually get sicker in some instances, or you might cause new problems, right? Like if you take more opiates or sedatives than prescribed, you might end up with becoming dependent on that substance. And you know, when you become dependent on the substance, that's more or less an addiction, right? So that's another really big reason that you don't want to mis make mistakes. And of course, the one thing none of us really, you know, who, especially now with COVID, none of us want to go to the hospital. And frankly, a doctor's office is, is risky too, especially in the midst of a pandemic, because sick people are going to the doctors, sick people are going to the hospital. You don't want to be one of those sick people. All right. So I, I kind of have been on some sort of a pulpit. So, you know, I've been kind of shaking my finger at you and telling you what not to do. Now I just want to sort of be informational. I want to talk to you about some of the things that you're commonly using so that although you may be really well informed about some of this stuff, some of the information I'm about to give you might be surprising. So we're going to start by talking about NSAIDs. And the reason why I put this, that acronym up there is because it's a really long name. So I'm going to tell you the long name. It's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. All right. So those are things that you're really familiar with. You see the picture of Advil, which I mentioned earlier. And no, I'm not getting any money to the, from the producers of Advil. Aspirin is really common. A lot of people are taking low dose aspirin for their heart health. Um, uh, Celecoxib or Celebrex, all of these, you know, many of these are going to be really familiar to you. They are among the most common pain relief medicines in the world. Every day, more than 30 million Americans use them to soothe headaches, sprains, arthritis symptoms, and other daily discomforts, according to the American Gastrointestinal Association. So that again, is a fairly large, well-known organization that basically is defining for you what NSAIDs are. And as if it wasn't enough, in addition to dulling pain, NSAIDs also lower fever and reduce swelling. So they really are wonderful and very useful medications. Um, many of us take these without talking to a doctor. In some cases, some of these like Voltaren are over the counter and aspirin's over the counter, Advil's over the counter and Aproxim. A lot of these are over the counter, but frankly, um, there are times when I definitely will ask a doctor, is this a good thing to be taking a leave for? Is this a good thing for you know, to take ibuprofen, which Motrin or Advil are the examples that I've already mentioned. But like so many, and, and I'll tell you why. If you already have, for instance, gastrointestinal problems, many of these substances can make those gastrointestinal problems, those tummy problems, stomach problems worse, right? So NSAIDs are associated with several uh, side effects. The frequency of side effects varies. So common side effects are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, decreased appetite, in some cases, you might even have things like rash or dizziness or headache. When you are having those last few, the rash, rashes and dizziness and headaches, if that's going on after you take an NSAID, you must, must, must call your doctor. That means something really bad is happening. When a rash erupts on your skin due to a medication you've taken, that means your, um, your 
system is saying, this is not working for me, it is a bad thing, okay? So your, 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 your immune system is having a really big response. So that's NSAIDs. We, I hope that if you have questions that we can talk about that toward the end of the program. I'm gonna talk now about analgesics. That is sort of a fancy name for painkillers. And you're gonna recognize again, a lot of the names here. Again, some of these are, are uh, brand names. Some of them like hydrocodone, which is the generic name for Vicodin, which you might be more familiar with. Um, so uh, analgesics, also called painkillers, are medications that relieve different types of pain from headaches to injuries to arthritis. All of the medications listed here, every single one is addictive, right? There is not one that I can see here that if taken incorrectly, not according to doctor's orders, uh, they can create some real problems for folks. Many of you from the news reports may be familiar with the name of fentanyl. Fentanyl has been a, a real factor in 30%, in a 30% increase in overdoses. At the end of 2021, we learned that over 100,000 people died from overdose dur during the year 2021, and that was largely due to fentanyl. It used to be that fentanyl was just found in pill form uh, as fentanyl, but now we're learning, and I, it sort of baffles me, but the drug cartels and the drug pushers are putting fentanyl in everything from marijuana that's bought on the street, not the dispensaries that you go to that are legal, but if you're buying marijuana, cocaine, heroin, almost anything that someone who's addicted to substances is buying on the street can contain fentanyl. Someone may be using a substance for the very first time in their life, and because fentanyl is such a strong opiate medication, it can kill you on your first use, especially if you're not tolerant of that kind of medication at all. It is very, very dangerous. And I will talk about what I mean by tolerance in a couple of minutes. So uh, again, just to sort of talk, so codeine and hydrocodone, some of you may have been offered by your doctor acetamin, with hydrocodone or with codeine. Some people have been offered Tylenol 3 and 4 for various kinds of pain. Uh, a lot of times when you've been to the dentist and you've had a dental procedure, that's very common to get T3s or T4s. Demerol and oxycodone are very strong pain medication. A lot of you have, have become familiar with oxycontin which uh, you, know, you may, may recently have heard about the, the legal case right now that's in the courts with the Sackler family. Their pharmaceutical company produced hydro, um, uh, Oxycontin. And so that might be why that name is familiar to you. And just one more word about analgesics, methadone, naloxone, and naltrexone, though they are, can be addictive in nature, are actually used in many cases to successfully treat folks that are having problems with opiate dependence. And another one that's not listed there is buprenorphine or suboxone. Those are commonly used. And the reason why, even though they themselves are addictive, the reason they're used to treat is that uh, the t it's really hard to build up a tolerance to those medications. So um, you would be sort of, you know, not cured, but you would put in re, um, remission your problem with the other opiate that you're taken by the methadone, naloxone, or naltrexone long before you could develop uh, dependency on them as well. So, so these are generally, um, again, methadone, naloxone, and naltrexone when prescribed by a doctor are generally fairly safe to take. Some of you might be taking various medications that are used for mental health reasons. I mentioned earlier that uh, probably over 15% of the United States population is taking antidepressants. Some that you're familiar with are what are called SSRIs like Lexapro, Prozac, Zoloft. Some of you might be taking SNRIs, which are medications like Pristique, Cymbalta, Effexor. Um, these um, came probably on the market back in the 1980s and early 1990s. And they've uh, really been lauded as really not quite miracle drugs, but really incredibly effective. But 
They have side effects that people don't like. Um, they lower libido. They um, take a long time to build up in your system. So you might be very, very depressed. You're given by your doctor Cymbalta or Lexapro. Lexapro in particular can take four to six weeks to take effect. So people maybe give up on it before it actually takes effect. So if your doctor pres prescribes what's called an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, hang in there, take it for at least six weeks. If at six weeks you're still not feeling the effects, talk to your doctor. It might not be the right medication for you. But for the most part, after four to six weeks, you're gonna start feeling the effects of the antidepressant. Anti-anxiety medications can be, again, feel like miraculous medications, but there's some things that go along with them that are not so great. So some of the familiar things that you may be taking, and generally they're offered to older adults for uh, anti-anxiety to reduce anxiety. And a lot of people have been feeling more anxiety during the COVID pandemic for a variety of reasons. And also you might be having trouble sleeping. I know my sleep definitely was impacted during uh, the early part of the pandemic, just so anxious about what the next thing is around the corner, what's gonna happen next politically, what's gonna happen next with our health. Um, so these medications can be very effective to help you with anxiety, to help you sleep better, but they also should never ever be taken in conjunction with alcohol. And as I said earlier, they have a long half-life, life. they stay in your system for a long time. And so really on a day that you take a sedative, like some of the ones I've mentioned, like Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, you should probably not be drinking on the same day that you're taking a sedative like that, because there is a chance that they're going, one is going to enhance the effect of the other, and you are at risk then for respiratory distress. It can actually affect your breathing adversely. You have to be really careful with sedatives. Stimulants also are similar in this sense. Um, though I can't imagine there's any reason to take stimulants. It used to be and some stimulants that you might be familiar with are Adderall or Concerta. Most people who take stimulants like that take it because they have a mental health problem that's why it's listed on this page and not any of the others. Uh, it's taken for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, used to be back in the 1960s and earlier than that, that might have been prescribed for diet and for reducing weight. It is no longer prescribed for that reason. Why? Because people became addicted to it, right? You become dependent on these stimulants. And so they're really not safe to take. Antipsychotics, um, generally these are for people with psychotic disorders or have side, you know, side, psychotic side effects of other medications they're taking. Some of you may have grown familiar with some of them like Abilify, Raylar. You may have seen commercials on television for some of these, Zyprexa. Seroquel is commonly used, I hate to say it, on some levels in nursing homes. Um, I'll give you an example from my own life. My father, may he rest in peace when he was still alive, was in a uh, facility, a nursing facility, and was given a low dose of Seroquel, about 25 milligrams, because he had become aggressive and he actually had hauled off and hit another client at the nursing home. And so they wanted to calm him down a little bit. I didn't, I was not troubled with 25 milligrams because I know that that's really, it's just very slightly sedating so that he wasn't going to be aggressive anymore. Um, if a loved one of yours or a significant other of yours is on Seroquel, if it's a low dose, probably not a problem. If they're getting a high dose, it might be because they do have a psychotic disorder, but high doses of 300, 400 milligrams, that's a lot. And if they don't have a psychotic disorder, they probably, you would, again, want to consult with their physician because that is a lot of mood, uh, mood stabilizer and antipsychotic. Mood stabilizers you're probably familiar with um, if you uh, suffer from or know someone who suffers from bipolar disorder. So uh, mood stabilizers would include lithium, Abilify. And the next three, three I'm going to mention are also anti-seizure medications. So Tegretol, Lamictal, and Depakote serve as mood stabilizers for some, but anti-seizure medication for others. So it's really interesting that these medications have a dual purpose. 
So I'm going to move on because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for question and answers and we're getting we're, we're getting into the weeds a little bit, so I need to move a little faster. So I'm going to talk a little bit about possible side effects. You can see on this little aggregate of side effects, all the kinds of things you might recognize, some that, some that you have experienced from some of the medications that you take. So Synergy, I've mentioned before, it's basically think of it as instead of one plus one equaling two, one plus one equals four, six, nine, or 10. So that means if you take, for instance, a sedative and alcohol at the same time, one enhances the effect of the other. And so the effect of the medication is increased and considerably less safe because you, you, you can't really account for what might happen because you don't know how much the synergy is going to occur. So you have to be careful of that. Another thing that might happen is that one drug is not going to uh, happily coexist with another. So as an example, if you're taking the natural medication coenzyme Q10, uh, CoQ10 for short, it will adversely affect things like warfarin, uh, card cardizem, tiazac, and other things, or gentivin. It actually has some negative impact on those medications Conversely, if you take CoQ10 with a statin, it actually increases the effectiveness. So it has an up and down kind of effect. Also, some of you who take statins have probably learned from your doctor that you shouldn't be eating grapefruit and other citrus fruits, but mostly grapefruit is the big, uh, the big one there, is you really should not be taking grapefruit with a statin. Uh, they find that the two together have something of a toxic effect in your system. And finally, tolerance, which can be referred to as drug dependence. So if you take, uh, for instance, an opiate, if you don't stop taking an opiate when the doctor tells you to, you are at risk of developing a dependency on that substance, which means if you suddenly stop taking an opiate medication like Vicodin without talking to your doctor first, you could really have some very unpleasant effects. You could have um, experienced diarrhea, your nose and your eyes are gonna run. It's gonna be really, it'll almost feel like having a flu. So you don't wanna be dependent upon an opiate medication because it's very hard to get back to norm, feeling normal if you become dependent on an opiate or on a stimulant, for that matter, on alcohol. So you wanna avoid drug, uh, drug tolerance whenever possible. Some quick talk about some herbal remedies. So some of these might be very familiar with you. And the big point I'm gonna make about these is that many of them are, are not well-researched, but many of them are, and we know some stuff about them. We know, for instance, that there is insufficient evidence of efficacy with regard to valerian root. A lot of people take it for anxiety or heart palpitations, thinking it's gonna help them. We don't have evidence to say that that's in fact true. Lots of people take echinacea for the common cold. There is some evidence to say that it can be effective in that. Stinging nettle, who knew? It actually is highly effective for several different things for urinary tract infection, a fever, osteoarthritis, which basically is, so stinging nettle, all of those things involve inflammation. So stinging nettle is a very effective natural anti-inflammatory. Many, many people take melatonin. It's used generally to treat insomnia. Research is not definitive. However, the, the, we are finding out that melatonin might be more beneficial for older adults who could be melatonin deficient. So melatonin might be, we're, we're finding from research, really helpful for older adults. And the last one I'm gonna talk about is turmeric. Well, actually it's not the last one, there's another slide, but turmeric has natural inflammatory compound, compounds called curcuminoids. And curcuminoids have been associated with positive effect on various diseases. And the Mayo Clinic is where a lot of the studies have been done on turmeric or turmeric. Um, those diseases include type two diabetes, obesity, inflammatory bowel disease and cancer. But again, I know I've said this again and again and again, please, please, before you take any of these substances, check with your doctor because some of these don't 
marry well with other medications. You want to make sure that if you're taking any of them, even though it's over the counter, you don't have to get a prescription, you still should check with your doctor. Chamomile was believed to be helpful for gastrointestinal problems. It might ease anxiety a little bit. There's some research that says that it does, but it really, you know, maybe if it eases anxiety, your nervous tummy may feel better, but it really doesn't have very much effect on your gastrointestinal system, except to ease an anxious tummy. Arnica, on the other hand, has been well-researched. Some of you maybe use it when you've got bruises or aches and pains. It's a very effective anti-inflammatory. And the nice thing about all of these natural remedies is you can buy them over the counter. You don't need a prescription. That doesn't mean you shouldn't talk to your doctors first. I've mentioned coenzyme Q10 a lot. Uh, or CoQ10, it's an antioxidant that your body produces naturally. So you already have it in your body. Your cells use CoQ10 for growth and maintenance. Supplements might be beneficial for treating conditions such as congestive heart failure and preventing migraines. It's considered safe with few side effects. However, again, because with some medications like warfarin, it is not safe. So you do need to talk to your doctor first for sure. And I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to quickly talk about the FDA, and then we're going to really, you know, really go quickly through these next several slides. Um, a lot of you have heard about the FDA with regard to the vaccines that we have been getting for uh, our problems with COVID, and know that in the case of these vaccines, they were really pushed through rather quickly. But that doesn't mean they didn't go through all of the trials that you see here. So they go, all drugs that are approved by the FDA go through all of these phases that you see here. So there's basic research, just, you know, really doing lots of con controlled studies and looking at what's going on. They find some stuff out, which is the discovery part. Then there's some things that are done before the actual clinical trials where there are much more controlled studies and there's phase one, phase two. So as you can see, they go through lots of phases before they get even a full FDA review. And then, and this is something that you should know about the COVID vaccines is they are now in phase four or the post-approval parts. And you know, except for the ones that are gonna go to the kids that are under five years old, those are in earlier stages because they found at certain doses it wasn't effective. So they doubled back to some of the earlier phases. But with most of your vaccines, they are in phase four. So they have been through all of this. And any medication that's FDA approved goes through lots and lots of phases. And I really wanted you to know about that. And finally, clean out your medicine chest at least once a year maybe every six months, every three months, depending on how many medications you take and how often you refill them. It's really much safer because lots of things can happen. Accidental poisonings, people visiting your house, looking through your medicine cabinet and saying, mm, that looks like a medication I'd like to take. I hate to think that that's happening to you, but we know that a huge percentage of uh, drug overdoses and drug uh, use um, has, happens as a result of, of theft or scams. So you have to be really, really careful. Uh, and also protect your environment. Don't flush things down the toilet or down your sink drain. Uh, there's lots of places. Um, Walgreens has a program and other um, um, drugstore chains, CBS have special um, drug disposal programs. Maybe your local Lease department might have some uh, drug disposal programs. So I'm gonna go ahead and come out of my, uh, my share so that we can talk, you know, again, you need to really be careful about your medications because while they are in some cases just miraculous, they can be really unsafe if not taken with consultation with your doctor, your pharmacist, your psychiatrist, and those, you should trust those people. They know what they're saying. So I'm going to shut up for a minute. We have, uh, we have, we have about. I really rushed through a little bit of that at the end. I apologize for that, but we do therefore have ten minutes for Q and A. Mm -hmm. So have at it. Let me know what people are asking, Roseanne. 
So right now we've only got one question in the Q&A. And so I wanna just take a moment and encourage folks, if you have a question, if anything came up, I, it was a lot of content. <laughs> um, Nina, you squeezed a ton of information into that short time and we so appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the question that we have right now is a, a very specific question about a Seroquel dose. It, it asks if you consider 50 milligrams of Seroquel a low dose for sleeping. That's 55 -0. 50. Yeah, that's a pretty low dose, right? When you start getting above 100, then, then in all likelihood, it's being prescribed for psychotic symptoms like hearing things, seeing things, and delusional ideas, paranoia. At 50 milligrams, most often that's prescribed to help people just relax and sleep at night. That's usually what it's used for. And also for people like my dad, who had become aggressive by virtue of his Alzheimer's disease, um, 25, 50 milligrams is generally was prescribed in those instances. And then there's a question about what about synergy and side effects? So uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the question is targeting. So, you know, yeah. while I'm talking, you can maybe clarify. So synergy, um, the best example I can give is lots of people are prescribed sedatives for either anxiety or sleep. And these are medications that have potential for becoming addictive. That's one piece. But a lot of people take them not understanding, you know, it's rare that a doctor would fail to tell you that you shouldn't be drinking while you're taking a sedative, but that's a situation where synergy happens. So if you're taking, say, clonopin, and then decide of an evening to have a cocktail or two, you put yourself at risk of that synergistic effect. So the alcohol enhances the effect of the clonopin or the other sedative that you're taking, and so you're gonna get more effect than you bargained for. And conceivably it could affect your breathing. It could actually depress your respiratory system. And generally when there's overdose on sedatives, it oftentimes can be because someone's also had alcohol and it depresses their respiratory system. Does that help? I hope. I think that was a good answer to that question. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, Another question is, if my Tylenol expired six months ago, do I have to buy a new bottle? I have it just in case, but years go by without using it. Yeah, I, I, it's nice to have something in your medicine cabin just in, cabinet just in case. But I personally, I go through my medicine cabinet probably at least once a year, sometimes every six months. And how what you know, I know that some of us are on you know, financial restrictions, but uh, you, you really, if it's expired, you should not be using it because, you know, we don't know what's happening. It might, you know, in addition to being expired, it might be exposed to too much heat or too much cold. And, you know, you really don't know how it's going to affect you. What, you know, I, I have not studied the precise effects of expired Tylenol or other acetaminophen, but I, I know that you really should never ever use an expired medication. Some people go, nah, it's, you know, it's only been a few months, no big deal. Big deal. Mm -hmm. Why would you take a chance? Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, I take a generic protonics for GERD. It seems to yes. help, but some days the side effects like headaches, nausea, bad taste can be really rough. Doctors tend to dismiss these side effects. That's when you can actually reach them, which can be difficult these days. Oh, I love, I love that question. I, it, yes, there are a number of protonics. They, many of them do have side effects. My own daughter took them for a while, had an issue with GERD. Um, and she, she actually has some of the same um, side effects. Some of her side effects had to do with the other medication she's taking. So I would say if, if your physician is not as available to you as you think he or she or they should be, definitely talk to your pharmacist. The pharmacist tends to be luckily more available to us because you can walk into your local drugstore and ask the question. They may then refer you to your physician if they're not 100% sure about what's going on. 
because it could be another medication you're taking. It could be other medical issues that are going on. It may just be the side effect of that particular protonic. It might be another one. We'll agree with you more. So yeah, I mean, I know it's frustrating. Um, you know, I'm not going to suggest you see another doctor because that doctor might be really wonderful. And when you get to see that doctor, you might really love it when you get that opportunity. I would say you have the right to be pretty forceful. I'm going to empower you to uh, nag your doctor to get back to you. I, I have been known to leave nasty voicemails. I mean, I don't use bad language, but I say, Dr. So-and-so, I think it's time you got in touch with me because I'm having symptoms and it's your job to help me cope with these symptoms, right? It's okay for you to talk to your doctor like that if, if your doctor's not being responsive. So I'm going to empower you to do that. I think that's great. We don't have another question right now, but I, I think it's just good, Nina, to, to look at how important this issue is when we look at who we are as a culture, when we look at our medical system and the way the doctors are treating us. And, you know, I always think of the pressure and the time limits on a doctor visit and that tendency to hand us a prescription or make a suggestion that we take an over-the-counter medication mm -hmm. and layering these medications so readily. Um, yes, and, and you know, again, that empowerment, you know, Roseanne knows I actually have another program similar to this one called Empower, where the whole focus is to say to older adults who are on Medicare and actually technically a medical doctor under Medicare on a regular visit gets 15 minutes with you paid, period. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna wanna kind of rush you through that exam, but I believe that you have the right, you, have, you know, it's not just my belief, it's just the reality. You have the right to say, doctor, I know you <laughs> wanna get on to your next client, but you need to answer my questions because my health is at risk if I don't take this medication exactly as it's meant to be taken. You have the right to say, doctor, I don't understand. And answer, ask questions like, should I eat with this? What time of day should I take it? You know, what happens if I take too much? What, what do I do if that happens by, you know, because, you know, older adults, we forget that we took it and then we take another dose. So we need to be mm -hmm. able to access our doctor's response. And I know sometimes that doesn't happen. Be tough. Yeah. Stay strong. <laughs> in response to that, a great question uh, or comment, really. It, it says doctors may recommend something, but they don't mention the side effects. Yes. How can I find out whether or not to take a medication? Again, certainly don't leave the office unless you know what those side effects are. One of the, one of the handouts that Roseanne is going to send to folks that are on this Zoom will actually give you a list of about 10 to 12 questions to make sure you ask the doctor if you're getting a new medication. And one of those questions needs to be the side effects. When you actually fill the prescription, first of all, you can ask your pharmacist for a large print printout of all of the side effects, indications, mm -hmm. all the things that are contained on that printout will help you also take the medication more safely. Um, that's one of the reasons those printouts exist. Sometimes you think, oh, I just want to, you know, go ahead and recycle all this paper I'm getting when I come home from the pharmacy. Do not get rid of those side effect, those mm -hmm. printouts until you've read them thoroughly, because even though the doctor, you know, is well-meaning, they may forget to tell you something. They're also human beings, right? So it's best to look at those printouts. I certainly always look at them exhaustively because you know, I take Lipitor, I take a lot of supplements. I wanna make sure that my vitamin C isn't going to count, count, be contraindicated with the medication the doctor's given me. That's great, really good advice. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for the entire presentation. What a thoughtful discussion and so important for all of us to be aware of everything, you know, the prescribed medications, the over-the-counter, um, the legalization of marijuana and, and the effects of alcohol, all of it, um, looking at its effect on our, on our body. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out that everyone who attended today is going to receive an email a little bit later today. There will be a link in that email for a program evaluation. If you can take a moment and fill out the program evaluation, it's very helpful to us. 
as well in that email, there will be handouts that Nina just referenced. There'll be a copy of this presentation and more information. Um, I'm also going to include a link and uh, the link will take you to our webpage where these Insights on Aging program recordings end up. It will take a couple of weeks for this to, recording to be um, worked on, edited, and but it will appear there at the link that's in the email. And then I want to remind folks that we're going to gather again in May. We're not meeting in April, but in May, we're going to have a program, May 13th. May is actually Mental Health Month. And we'll have two of our favorite <laughs> therapists from CJE Counseling, that Sharon Dornberg Lee and Lisa Andrews. They'll be talking about checking in on our mental health. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Nina, for a great presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Be well <laughs> and look for that email, folks. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you so much, Roseanne. I appreciate the opportunity to meet with all of you. Thanks so much. Take care, Nina. Bye-bye now. Bye.